Hey, listeners, there are exactly two swear words in this episode. So if you're with someone who shouldn't hear that or doesn't want to, you've been warned. Enjoy. Hiya, character comedy turning death into a living. One o'clock, four stars. Okay, thank you. Enjoy your friends. Thank you. Say that again. It's August in an ancient city. The cobbled streets are filled with festival goers or punters as they are called here. Hopeful artists, hired help, friends, family, or in my case, a podcast host, call out and hand out flyers on the long path up to a castle, hoping to entice new audience members to come to a show. Flyering is the most painstakingly humiliating experience ever. If your skin isn't thick pre-flyering, it will be pursed. I could sell a car to Lewis Hamilton at this point because I have had to sell, sell, sell. It's fine, especially when you know the hot spots and you know what you're doing, but you no, know, flyering is a chore. That's Camille Hainsworth, a performer who is part of News Review in 2022, the world's longest running live musical comedy show. And I'm talking to her in Edinburgh, Scotland, at the largest arts festival in the world, the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, or the Fringe, as most people call it. Over 2 million tickets will be sold to shows throughout the festival this year. The Fringe is the third most ticketed event in the world after the Olympics and the FIFA World Cup, except this event happens yearly. And most people outside the arts and the UK have never even heard of it. Those flyering hope the punters who take the flyer will turn into one of those millions of tickets sold and a ticket to their show. The punters might take the flyer, but more likely they avoid eye contact or pretend they don't hear or just flat out refuse. Hi ladies, if you're looking for a show, I have a character. Okay, enjoy your fringe. For those coming to watch, it's a chance to discover a show before anyone else see the beginnings of something or someone big, or see something that changes them. But there was something about Edinburgh. It just draws you back again and again and again and again. And it's the people, the community, the work. My name is Anthony Alderson. I am the director of the Pleasant Theatre Trust, which means running a venue at the Edinburgh Fringe, which I've done since 2005. You take a West End theatre and you strip away the chandeliers and the paintwork and the proscenium arch and all the grandeur and all the red velvet chairs and everything else. We are no different. The Fringe is no different to any of those buildings. It's about the people on stage and the stories they're telling. And you don't get to experience it in such a raw way anywhere else as you do in Edinburgh. And every year I see something which absolutely changes my mind about something. Every year for three weeks in August, every space in Edinburgh that might hold a few people suddenly becomes a performance space. A restaurant, a pub, a room above a pub, a classroom, a church, a bathroom, or even a cab. Some venue spaces are erected specifically for the fringe, then torn down at the end of the month and stored until the next fringe. Artists from around the world come to Edinburgh to perform in these spaces to prove themselves as actors, comedians, writers, acrobats, street performers, directors, and producers. They come with dreams, ambitions, and hopes that these three weeks will pay off. The blood, sweat, tears, the money spent, and the flyers handed out will all be worth it. I guess you're looking at like Phoebe Waller-Bridge, right? And, and Fleabag, like that could happen. It probably won't, not to be the Debbie Downer, but the likelihood is low, but still like there is that dream. I'm Sarah Vegis. I'm the senior producer at Nouveau Riche and the creative producer at Sarah Vegis Productions. Fleabag premiered here in 2013 in a 60 seat theater to rave reviews and awards. The theater piece was turned into a television show with critical and financial success, winning awards and making a household name of its creator, Phoebe Waller-Bridge. Waller-Bridge went on to create Killing Eve, among other things, and most recently was seen in the latest Indiana Jones film. Six the Musical was created by two Cambridge University students and premiered here in 2017. I saw it in 2018 when it came back to The Fringe. The buzz around it was electric. It was the show to see, and it did not disappoint. Six now tours the U.S., the U.K., and our Broadway and West End mainstays. And the two students, Toby Marlowe and Lucy Moss, won a Tony Award for Best Original Score in 2022. In 2023, Six the Musical won a Grammy for Best Musical Album. Stephen Fry, Rowan Atkinson, John Cleese, Robin Williams, Emma Thompson, 
many other comedians and actors got their start or shot to fame after their shows at the Fringe. Miranda Hart, the quote, English queen of comedy, went to the Fringe several times with some shows being canceled due to low audiences before her show Miranda Hart's House Party, which then became her hit UK television show Miranda, took off. It's the one place where you can probably get most of the regional venues to come and see your work. Uh, you meet loads of different people. You get international people. Like You have TV people there who are scouting. So it is literally like the annual event for all theatre, TV, art people. Whether they see your show or not, they are there. So that opportunity is there and that possibility is there. And I guess that's like the hope. Still, for every Phoebe Waller-Bridge, Six the Musical, and Stephen Fry, there are thousands, maybe even millions of artists you have never heard of. Many like Miranda Hart come year after year, but you never hear their turnaround story or see their show. Maybe the right critic didn't see it. Maybe they didn't have the audience numbers or maybe their show was lost to the noise. The money, time, and energy spent creating their show, advertising it, putting it on, flyering, and dreaming of what could be lost to the fringe. Mark Marin, well-known comedian and host of the WTF podcast, has stated several times on his podcast he would never come back to the fringe. My name is Molly Merwin. I like to say I'm an actor on my taxes. But as anyone knows who is an actor or works in the creative arts, there's being an actor and then there's what you do. For me, I'm also a podcaster and sometimes a producer. In 2018, I was the associate producer for Dangerous Giant Animals, a one-woman show exploring disability in a family from the sibling's perspective. The show won an award in one of the most well-known venues at the Fringe, Underbelly, the same operator as Fleabag. I understand the hustle and chaos it takes to get a show on and to be seen. I've been to six Fringes and have performed myself, sort of. A few times I subbed in my friend's improv show. I was also the U.S. news anchor projected on a screen in Leverage, a show put on by some of the students at my drama school in 2019. Every year, I have multiple friends and colleagues perform at the Fringe. I hear about the good shows and the bad ones, but I've never had to put everything on the line, put up my money, my written work, be evaluated in something I've been working on for months or sometimes years, and put myself completely out there like artists and performers do every year, day after day, hoping this will be the turning point. After all my experiences with Fringe, and after over seven months of countless interviews, research, and conversations on and off record, I feel like I'm just scratching the surface. Even now, Fringe seems like a lake whose beauty inspires everyone, but no one knows its depths. I am still learning new and deeper things about Fringe as I go into post-production for this podcast. I am worried I'm missing something, and I'm sure I am. How can I tell you everything about the thousands that perform and come here to watch every year? But I wanted to tell this story for several reasons. For the artists who have done it, for the artists who want to do it, and for those wondering why. Why do people spend months or years creating a show, putting on rehearsals or taking it on the road to work and rework, spending thousands of pounds promoting it, putting themselves out there day after day for weeks, and at best, break even, and worse, lose thousands? Just for French. It seems like madness. Maybe it is. Maybe it's something else. This is a story of highs and lows, complicated housing politics, misconceptions, gambles taken, some paying off, some not, and adventurous people doing something no one in their right mind would do. This is the story of dreams, ambitions, and reality colliding in a city thousands of years old. This is Fringe Benefits Edinburgh, a story of the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. I think the only way to describe Fringe is Fringe. It is its own thing. There wasn't this concept of a Fringe festival or fringy work before Edinburgh existed. That's Lindsay Jackson, Deputy Chief Executive of the Edinburgh Festival Fringe Society. I think everybody still to this day thinks it's a comedy festival. <laughs> you still have that sort of, oh yeah, Edinburgh Comedy Festival. And so we spend a lot of time encouraging people to understand that it's not just a comedy festival. Comedy is a large part of it, but 
it has everything else. And I think that sometimes with, with when you're talking to new audiences or people who've never been, like, oh, it's just drama graduates and community groups. And it's like, oh, no, no. I mean, they're here, but so are the world-class, internationally renowned performing arts talent. At the time of recording, five festivals occurred during all or most of August in Edinburgh. The Edinburgh International Festival, the Royal Edinburgh Military Tattoo, the Edinburgh International Book Festival, the Edinburgh Art Festival, and the Fringe. There are also around five other festivals taking place throughout August. I think it holds some of the greatest performance work in the world. Uh, I also think the Fringe was always looked on as being second, secondary to the Edinburgh International Festival. You know, the classical festival of classical music and uh, dance and opera uh, was seen as the kind of engine that pulled the festival train along. And the Fringe was somehow a kind of secondary thing of people that were maybe not first rate doing their thing. I think that's not the case anymore. So I'm William burdick I'm the Artistic Director and CEO of Assembly Festival. I started off the kind of multi-venue concept back in 1981 when I took on the Assembly Rooms in George Street. A study published this year by BOP Consulting found that all the festivals combined create £500 million for the Edinburgh economy, supporting 8,000 jobs with a £33 return for every £1 of public money spent. In 2011, a similar study was published and it found that all the festivals generated over £261 million of additional tourism revenue for Scotland in 2010. So in just over a decade, the festivals have almost doubled what they bring to the economy. And in that study, they found the Fringe alone contributed £142 million of this in 2010. That's 58%. Before going to the Fringe for the first time, I didn't even know the other festivals existed. And then when I saw the other festivals, I thought, why would they want to compete with Fringe? But the Fringe actually started as a response and counter movement to the Edinburgh International Festival in 1947. The British government had decided to put on an international festival of theater and art to try to heal the wounds of Europe after World War II. And they chose Edinburgh because it was the least bomb city after the war. Eight fringe companies who had not been invited to be part of the international festival. They were called the Uninvited Eight, or the Fringe Adjuncts, I think that one person rudely called them. And it was kind of a protest, and there was a little theatre company from Glasgow who wanted to do the Lower Debts Gorky play, and they rented what is the Pleasant Theatre. And they raised the equivalent of, well, it was £800 back then, it's about 30 grand now to put on a play it was paid for by the people of Glasgow. I love the irony that the Edinburgh Fringe was started by the people of Glasgow. Scottish journalist and playwright Robert Kemp coined the term fringe in a review for the Edinburgh Evening News a year after the first Fringe and International Festival. He said, <clears throat> around the fringe of the Arvisto official festival drama. Okay, actually, you know what? Out of respect for the country of Scotland and my Scottish friends, I am not going to attempt a Scottish accent. Okay, so Kemp said, round the fringe of official festival drama, there seems to be more private enterprise than before. And thus, the term fringe was born. He added, I'm afraid some of us are not going to be at home during the evenings. Over the years, more and more artists and performers come to be a part of the Fringe, from students to professionals. Today, there are over 250 venues with over 3,000 shows. Before the halfway point of the 2023 Fringe, over a million tickets were sold. In the end, it would sell over 2,445,000 tickets. So for those artists that want to stay on the Fringe, that want to bring work regardless of curation, regardless of whether or not anyone thinks it's fits to their space if they have the ability to come then edinburgh is a home for them in august because it is an open arts festival there are very few open festivals left or at all that's sam goff chief executive at summer hall a year-round arts village in edinburgh and in august the fifth biggest venue at the fringe the fringe is an opportunity to experiment to take risks to run with ideas without anyone saying actually I don't like where you go. Do you know what? I'm going to come anyway. It's potentially brilliant, bonkers, but it, it's from the heart. So it's got a reason to exist. So what Sam is saying about the Fringe being an open arts festival is essential to understand because this means there is no large organization or governing body 
determining who can come as you would get at other festivals. The founding principle of the Fringe is to be a, quote, open access festival that accommodates anyone with a desire to perform and a venue willing to host them. I've got the Fringe programs going right the way back to 99, which is the first program I've got. And it's it's like a, a slither of its, its current size. My name is Alex Petty and I run Laughing Horse and we run the free Edinburgh Fringe Festival. There's so many different voices in there, so many different venues that it's it's now an arts festival that you've got different venues, different producers, lots of venues with different ideas. In 1958, the Fringe Society was formed to help formalize the Fringe. It's a 35-person charity that supports the festival by providing information to artists and audiences, publishing a program of shows, acting as a sort of diplomat for the Fringe, and providing a box office. But it's important to note, the Fringe Society does not determine who comes. It's the venues. What's unique, I guess, about the Fringe Society is your job is attached to a festival that isn't under your control. Lindsay Jackson again, Deputy Chief Executive of the Fringe Society. And you have to spend a lot of time managing and balancing and juggling bits of it that want different things. And often they want completely contrary and opposite things. You're always riding in between some of those contradictions and some of those challenges. And there's always complications where people are like, oh, Fringe Society, you cancelled that show or you, you did this thing. So I think that single Fringe experience, we can offer that to a large degree. But it does mean that when things go not necessarily wrong, but when there's blame to be made for the Fringe and, and its many challenges, that, that often gets put at our door. Although I do think that's part of the job is to shield the fringe individually and whether that's a venue, a performer or a a promoter or an audience member, to shield them a little bit from some of that noise and to be that buffer in between that that can offer a little bit of protection because this is hard enough as it is particularly for artists. Fringe is hard for artists. There is no way around it. It's a lot of pressure, I think, I would say. My name is Daisy Earl and I'm a professional stand-up comedian. I don't know whether it feels the same in other industries, but I think in comedy especially, there seems to be a lot of attention or excitement about somebody being new and being novel. And it means that they really want you to come out swinging and be almost brilliant immediately, which is strange because in most industries, no one is expected to come in and be brilliant. You're expected to learn and eventually be brilliant. But I think if you can win newcomer, it's such a way to kind of elevate someone's career quite quickly. It means there's just a lot of pressure, I think, on that first hour. Not like touring a show the rest of the year around a single venue. The competition is intense. The complexity of running, you know, eight, 10 shows in the space and you being part of it is huge. Uh, so trying to sort of achieve your best in this very, very complex scenario is, is kind of crucial. That's William Burdick Coots again from Assembly Festival. So what kind of person signs up for this, this pressure and complex scenarios, putting their lives on hold for weeks at a time? We meet two of them after the break. I did tell my granddad about Edinburgh this, I went to see him a couple of weekends ago and it was quite funny. And I was like, you know, I'm going out, you know, for some people it's, it works out great. And then other people, not for much, um, probably going to maybe just break even, likely probably going to lose money. And at the end he was like, why are we asking me, Van? What's the point? And what'd you say? <laughs> I was like, oh, for, you know, that's a great question, granddad. And I think I just waffled about, you might make it, something good might come from it. <laughs> But I just thought he's just asking, he's just saying those things out loud that we're, that we're all like, I'm me and I'm an actor and I suppose writer, although I find that one a harder one to identify with, but I write things, so I must be a writer. <laughs> Neve is an actor and a legitimate writer, bringing her first solo show to the Fringe in 2023. Her show, Get Blessed, will be one of over 3,500 shows at the Fringe this year. I'm speaking to Neve in May, four months before she heads up to the Fringe. Still working on selling it, Molly, but it's basically a character comedy solo show about a woman called Anya who is 
a what we call a celebrant. So she does non-religious ceremonies, so naming ceremonies and weddings. But at the fringe, she's here to teach you the art of the perfect send off in the form of a funeral. So the audience are her class, essentially, and she's teaching them like really how to make money off of dead people, really, I suppose you could say. <laughs> I never wanted to do the fringe. I thought this is it's terrifying. And I saw so many of my friends go up there and just get really burnt out. And my husband actually went last year and he had a great time overall. But yeah, you can just see how challenging it is to go and kind of keep your head above water for the whole month. And also the, the lead up to it as well. It's very intense, just the amount of things that you have to do, especially if you're also working, which obviously a lot of artists also have other jobs. So it's like very challenging. But in November 2022, a small theater in London called Etc. had a good box office deal on for a festival. Her husband, Mike, who is also an actor, took two of the slots they were offering, but then realized he didn't need both and offered her the other slot. She had an idea that had been, as she put it, bumbling around in her head. And the slot at the theater gave her the motivation to write it and put it on. And then afterwards, I was like, oh, I should really bring this to Edinburgh. I just feel in my heart, like, you know, a gut instinct that you have that I'm like, this is something that will work there. I hope like, we'll find out. And also last year I had pretty quiet year, artistic wider performance wise. And this year I just thought, I'm just not going to sit around kind of waiting for something to happen. Like I have the power in my hands to like go and do this. And I'm just not doing it because I'm scared, like essentially. And loads of my other friends that I admire have gone and done it and just bitten the bullet and just done it. And it's like, why are you not doing it? Out of fear, basically. And it just kind of aligned where I was like, this is the right thing to bring. So you're just going to have to do it. Fringe does that. Something happens. Maybe a show idea comes to you. Maybe you want to make a change. Or maybe you are frustrated with your current situation and you decide to change it. The only person that's going to realize my potential and that's going to turn my potential into actual impact is me and there's no time like the present but I think that's a really key thing to anybody listening who's sort of like well you know she's taken that big risk and I couldn't do that and the truth is that for a long time neither could I and it's okay to wait there is a right moment even if it's not driven by ambition it's just driven by like fucking frustration and annoyance at other people like there will come a moment where you feel ready and feel strong enough to go to the next chapter I should check. Am I allowed to swear on this podcast? Hannah Crawford is the founder and producer of Thistle and Rose Arts, which is associated with five productions at the Fringe in 2023, which is kind of crazy. Most producers are only involved with two to three productions at most. Like Neve, I'm speaking to her months before the Fringe. And yes, for the record, anyone is allowed to swear on this podcast. Damn it. I've been around the Edinburgh Fringe for a long time. The first time I performed in it, I was 11. And then I think I've had a job of some description since I was 16 every single year. And the first time that I was in it in a producing capacity, I think I was 19. So I've seen it from almost every angle. I wanted to be a producer before I knew what a producer was. When I was at high school, I was in every single music group and musical theatre group going. I think I was always quite drawn to the sort of organising elements of that stuff. Like I always wanted to kind of know what was going on, what the structure of maybe a whole concert or a whole event was. Got all the way to the end of my degree and then I started to see a friend of mine who had studied mechanical engineering and he started posting stuff on Facebook and Instagram and I sort of messaged him and I was like, I don't know what it is you do, but I think I want to do it. So can I take you for a coffee and kind of grill you about what you do? And so we went for that coffee and he told me that he was a producer and I was like, oh, where have you been all my life? And then that was that. In February 2020, Hannah incorporated Thistle and Rose Arts in London. Three weeks later, this little thing called COVID happened and shut down the entire theater and arts industry. During the pandemic, Hannah learned her grandfather, who helped raise her, was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. The next few months, Hannah was back in Scotland acting as an end-of-life nurse, along with her grandmother, at a time when nurses that would have cared for her grandfather were in PPE gear and dropping things off at the door. After her grandfather passed, she got a remote job as the private secretary to the director of the COVID vaccine rollout at the Scottish government, a far cry from what she thought she would be doing at that time, launching her new production company. I sat on this idea of being a commercial producer and all the stories I wanted to champion and all of the things I knew I was capable of doing. But I knew that I would have to take a big risk in order to do it. Like until I committed to somebody to raise the money and to just make it happen somehow without knowing how I was going to make it happen, nothing was going to go anywhere. 
In March 2023, Hannah found herself back in London working on a one-year contract that was set to end in May. But the company she was working for came to her and said they had no more work. So on the 10th of March, I had my last day of work. But I was going to be paid for the job that I was no longer doing until the 2nd of May. So I had this sort of seven-week window. And I didn't really plan it. I just thought, who knows what's coming next? All I know is that I haven't got anything planned for Edinburgh this year yet. I probably can help some people. And until I know what I'm going to do next, I might as well just put some feelers out, meet some new people, see who I can lend a hand to. We'll see how it goes. So I sent this tweet out. I think I said, calling all theatre artists. I've got production management, producing, marketing skills. If you're headed to Edinburgh this year, whether you've got funding or not, hit me up if you want any help or advice or just a listening ear. She also sent the tweet to two friends in hopes of amplifying it because she never really got any reach. But before her friends could look at their WhatsApp, The tweet went viral with 45,000 views and 70 comments. I ended up having 30 conversations with predominantly artists who were self-funding and self-producing and either considering or intended on going to the fringe. A small number of whom had literally already paid their deposit and decided they were going, but most people were still tossing it up for lots of different reasons, mainly money. But out of that lot, there were five, there were originally six, but it came down to five people, not even shows because I hadn't read any of the scripts yet and I had no idea, actually, I had no proof that the shows were good. But there were just five people that I spoke to and I was like, number one, we get on, we clearly share the same values, but also you seem like a really good, hardworking, passionate human. And I just have a feeling that you've got a really great show. All five of those people had said to me, are you looking to take on any producing work at the Fringe? Can I ask, would you potentially produce my show? But everyone's main concern was, how do we find the funding? How do we find the money to make this happen? There it is. The M word, money. Anytime you bring up Fringe, the next word is usually cost or money. Most artists just accept they will not make any money. I think that's just a narrative that you hear from everyone that I've now adopted for myself. But I think even if you sell out your entire show, you might cover your cough, but I don't think you're going to make a profit based on how much you have to invest in going. And then even just pointing out, like, obviously you're still paying your rent in London while you're there. You're paying for your food and you're paying for, you know what I mean? Like you still have to pay for everything. You know, that's just your normal expenses on top of everything else that you have to consider. Some of the I'm in the middle of buying a house. I think especially when you get to like your early 30s, you're thinking about having children. Old me in my 20s would have been like, well, I'll just quit my job and go to Edinburgh because like, I want to go to Edinburgh and I'll make it work and I'll be really broke or I'll whatever. I'll figure it out when I get back. But I couldn't leave my job because it's tied up with me getting a mortgage. So when Hannah saw all of the artists she spoke to having the same problem, cost, she decided to consult mentors and other producers she had worked for. And they all had the same advice. Don't get involved in the fundraising. It's too much risk for you. You go back to them, give them your flat fee to produce something and you can do the fringe and then get out again. But you know, you leave the fundraising to them. But there was something not right to Hannah about that advice everyone was giving her. So I went back to the five artists. I said, I will produce your show and I will raise the money for your show to make it happen. And I will charge a producing fee out of the money that I raise. If I don't raise the money, you don't pay me. Just how did Hannah get to her unconventional plan? And how does she plan to make it work? And how does Neve plan to make Fringe work financially while she deals with the biggest challenge so far in the lead up to Fringe? Making time for everything. I work a nine to five, 40 hour a week job at the minute. So it has been challenging to fit this stuff in amongst that always feel like there's something I could be doing and even if it's not something like admin wise it's like I should really be working on my actual show because that's the most important thing that I'm doing is bringing like this piece of work. The answer to both of those questions on the next Fringe Benefits Edinburgh. Throughout this series we'll be following Neve and Hannah as they navigate their journey to the Fringe, their experiences of the Fringe and the aftermath. Alongside them I explore the dynamics of the Fringe from costs to those complicated housing politics to all the big and little decisions that need to be made and considered not just by Hannah and Neve, but by everyone involved, from venue directors to first-time producers to seasoned professionals. On the next episode, we focus on the C word. Cost, I mean. We look at how cost is affecting artists, the city, and potentially the very future of the Fringe. The Fringe was always supposed to be the everyman's festival, and I think we're at risk of losing that if the interesting shows are being priced out. On this season of Fringe Benefits Edinburgh, It is a gauntlet. It will change your life. It'll deeply change you. Some of the venues I would love to play, I can't because I will not do a show that a disabled person cannot get into. 
It's not acceptable that we've got properties lying empty for months on end when we've got 5,000 people in city homeless. The truth is that the people who end up performing here are the people who can afford to perform here. It feels like it's because of the colour of your skin. Because you can't even say that like, oh no, I just made a bad show. Because the reviewers haven't come in to review it. Because if we can't get it to add up, then it won't carry on. And I think getting people to understand that is really important. I don't think a lot of people understand that most of the risk of a fringe show is taken by the artist. Nobody ever digs deep into this stuff at all. It's the only place you can go in the world where there is just so much of everything that everybody involved in the arts industry likes, loves and wants to be part of. Fringe Benefits Edinburgh was written, reported, edited, and hosted by me, Molly Merwin. Script consultant, Tom Noonan. Original music by Colette Jonas. Supporting producer, Alex Merwin. If you like this episode, please like and subscribe and maybe give us a five-star review. It helps continue podcasts like these. Thanks.